This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 104. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the strategy, people, process, and technology size of change. With me, as always, is Kyler. Uh, Kyler, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Good to have you here today. We've got an exciting show. You can find new episodes of this podcast every Wednesday on audio podcast platforms throughout the world, as well as YouTube. Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. It streams every Wednesday with new episodes. So be sure to check us out there. Uh, today's episode is going to be another fun-filled one. We're going to start off the segment by talking about a, a global government systems outage that was a result of outdated legacy IT systems. And uh, it's a case study based here in the United States where Kyla and, and I are based. It's uh, the Federal Aviation Administration or the FAA, which regulates air traffic uh, throughout North America, uh, recently had an outage as a result of their IT failures, uh, not a new implementation, but their legacy IT failures. So we're going to talk about that case study uh, in the opening segment here. We're also going to take some questions from social media as well. We're going to continue that theme or that thread that we started a couple weeks back of pulling questions and comments and discussion points from uh, various social media platforms. And then later in the show, we're going to have a, a couple of guests on the show. We're going to have AV and Megan uh, from a company called Advero Advisors, which is a, a company that's actually similar to Third Stage, but they focus on uh, public sector, government sorts of uh, transformations. And we're going to have a panel discussion of the differences and the similarities of digital transformations in the private versus public sector. Um, so that'll be a great conversation, regardless of which side you're on, whether you're private or public sector. And then later in the show, uh, in the third segment, we're going to get some independent digital transformation advice from another panel discussion, which will uh, include AV from Advero Advisors. It'll include myself, but it'll also include Greg Benton uh, from Third Stage as well. So he'll be on the show. And in that third segment, we're just going to talk about independent digital transformation best practices and general advice that we tend to give clients that are going through digital transformation. So Stay tuned for those guests in those panel discussions. But before we do, let's jump into the opening segment here with some of the, the hot topics and themes you wanted to cover here, Kyler. Absolutely. Well, let's start with our um, our trusty question jar and see kind of what some some more questions from social media. Just as a reminder, if you do comment on any of Eric's YouTube videos, on his TikTok, on LinkedIn, um, I put your questions in this question jar and I'll ask him um, in our first segment on ground control. So be sure to do that and I garner all of those. So let's just pull one out here, see what we're talking about. Um, let's see. Oh, this is actually a comment. Sometimes I like to include the silly comments. Um, you sound like a business professor. So very nice comment from TikTok because sometimes they're not so nice. So that's just a, a little ego boost before we start. So I, I don't know if that's a good thing though. Sounding like a business professor, that could be a backhanded, uh, backhanded compliment as well. You never know. Well, I think it was from one of our younger users. We do have this group of um, of business students that are forced <laughs> to yeah. watch our content. And sometimes, as young people are, they aren't always incredibly grateful, but they make us laugh. So we're grateful for them. Um, so um, it, this talks about wanting to educate executives. How do I educate my executives to learn more about the need for new technology? Great question. Well, um, to educate executives about the need for new technology, I think first you have to look at the cost benefit of what it's costing you in full and in total to maintain your current system. And, you know, what are the maintenance costs? What are the ongoing um, internal and external maintenance costs, as well as opportunity costs. How much money are you losing by not having 
uh, the potential value or benefits of a new technology. Um, and then, of course, you want to weigh those costs and benefits of sort of the status quo legacy scenario. And you want to compare that cost benefit analysis to the cost benefit of if you were to migrate to a new uh, technology or a new platform. And even if you, let's just say hypothetically, which is true 99% of the time, hypothetically, you're going to spend more in the new technology landscape. Um, you might find that it's not as big of a difference as you might think when you factor in all the hidden costs of maintaining legacy systems. But you also may find that the business value and the ROI is actually greater um, to migrate to a new platform. Um, on the flip side, it could also be, though, that it's not worth it or you don't have a, a solid ROI, in which case maybe you rethink what your strategy is um, overall. And one of the things we do with our clients, just as a side note, in, in something that is a good takeaway or a good what I'd consider a best practice is to look at different scenarios and different paths that you could pursue. Because I think a lot of times organizations, um, when they ask the question, do we replace our old systems or not? It's sort of a binary either or question. And really it's a, it's a series of scenarios that you could do. You could do an incremental uh, mild improvement to your systems. You could do a massive overhaul and a big bang approach. You could do best of breed. You could do a single ERP system. There's so many different variables that you can think through and, and quantify. So I think that's the big thing is just really to, um, quantify what the business value is. And that's probably the best way to sell the idea or the need or potential need to your executive team. Yeah. And, and I think just building on that, the holistic approach that you talk about a lot is so important because a lot of times what we see is, oh, this is, will benefit the IT department, accounting, the, and it's a very siloed way of thinking. But the way that we see a lot of executives wanting to approach that and educating about how it benefit the business as a whole. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, that's key. And I think, you know, the other one last thing I'll throw in there is I think the more you can quantify the better, because I, I mean, it's all, it's great to say, Hey, we're going to improve the customer experience. We're going to become more efficient. We're going to eliminate technical debt. There's a lot of different sort of qualitative benefits that may resonate with your executive team, but it's typically not going to resonate as strongly as, as a clear cut cost benefit ROI analysis that shows that there's real business value and a positive return if we if we do this and we do it right. Yep. Can't argue with data, right? Hard data. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's see. I got two stuck together here. Um, so this is an interesting one. Do you have any advice for marketing systems? As the marketplace is so saturated, we have trouble getting our word out. So this isn't exactly your specialty, but I think it's a, a good question and the fact of what happens when you are looking at one department specifically and having trouble creating that competitive advantage within a business structure? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a good, the question is a good one because it's a good reminder that digital transformation and software implementation doesn't always have to just be relegated to back office type stuff, which I think a lot of times it is. A lot of people think of that as sort of the driver of digital transformation is let's get you know, new accounting and financial systems, inventory management, um, HR, you know, all that core back office stuff, important systems, but there's other stuff too. There's the more customer facing side of it, the marketing side of it, especially for a, a smaller or high growth midsize organization that marketing systems and marketing automation can be uh, extremely powerful. I think, you know, the, the thing with marketing automation though, is there's so many different options to the, to the user's question here that um, it can be overwhelming. You've got a lot of really niche kind of smaller vendors that, uh, you know, focus just on marketing automation, like, um, you know, HubSpot and Zoho and some of those, those sorts of options. Um, a lot of them are blended, you know, marketing and CRM or marketing and sales automation. So um, a lot of them will do both. But, um, but the, I guess the thing you have to figure out first and foremost to figure out which marketing automation or which marketing technology is the best fit for you is to figure out, first of all, are you just looking for a marketing automation or a marketing sort of software, or are you looking for a marketing system that can also do other stuff like sales automation and CRM and potentially even more than that? And then the second question you have to ask is, do we want to do this as sort of a siloed decision, you know, as far as just go find a best of breed solution that helps us with our marketing needs, or do you need something that can do the marketing stuff, but also integrate with back office type stuff like inventory man or Inventory management is not the best, best example, but uh, finance and accounting and certainly CRM and order management, order processing, all that stuff. If, and if you want a more integrated solution that integrates with other parts of your business, then that's a different short list than you might look at if you're just looking at a standalone system. 
So lots of options out there. And that's why it's so important to have a clear vision to sort of narrow down what type of system you're really looking for. Yeah. And I, I think that integration piece is really key because making sure that you can not only create awareness and visibility on the marketing side, but how does it integrate with the the interoperability of all of your different systems? So you can do things like track that lifetime customer value, or um, like you said, you know, be able to attach data points to it. Um, so that that piece of it is, is so important. Um, but if you do have more general questions on software selection and our comparisons, um, check out our YouTube channel for sure. We get a lot of feedback that that helps when it comes to uh, software comparisons specifically for ERP, Sierra, um, um, and a variety of other systems. We have a whole playlist around it if you want to um, look at that. So a few more in here. So this is kind of going on the best of breed conversation. So this question is, do you think the big three will just acquire all of the best of breed systems and we're going back to a uh, bias of the big three? Um, yes, but um, I think I think they, they will probably continue to try to buy up the smaller players is what they've all three done in recent years over the last decade or two decades. Um, Microsoft, Oracle, SAP, they've, they've all sort of deployed a similar strategy of building their own organic flagship products, but also um, uh, acquiring others. And I shouldn't say that's not as true for Microsoft, I suppose. They, Microsoft truly has grown in the RP space throughout through acquisition, and now they're trying to piece it all together and sort of create a, a unified flagship product in Microsoft D365. Whereas Oracle has always had their flagship, you know, EBS or Oracle Fusion Cloud, whatever they want to call it for today. And then you've got SAP S4HANA, which is sort of their flagship product. But in addition to those two flagship products with SAP and Oracle, they've gone out and acquired, you know, JD Edwards. And um, in the case of, of Oracle, they've acquired Hyperion, they've acquired um, Siebel, who was an old CRM system. So they, they acquired a lot of different systems. PeopleSoft is another one. So they acquired a bunch of different systems over the years. and, and um, that that's been their strategy and now sap has done something similar when they bought it concur and ariba success factors etc um but what i think this does so on one hand the, the person asking the question i agree with that it, it's just now you've created the situation where the big three are even bigger and now they've bought up the smaller upstar or the the um you know the more focused solutions like a hyperion on enterprise performance management or success factors on the hr hcm side of things um, so yes, they have done that. They've consolidated, they've created more of a big three bias. The big three has gotten even bigger, but I think what it does is it now creates more opportunity for smaller, newer software vendors to fill in the void and to provide something different. I think as long as the market is craving something different than one of the big, the big guys, which I think they always will, I think there's always going to be a, a nice tension in the marketplace that creates opportunity for these, these, uh, more best of breed solutions. Cause no matter how hard. Oracle, SAP, Microsoft, and bigger vendors try, they just can't be everything to everyone. And they're going to create openings for smaller software vendors to do something better that they're not, that they're not able to do. So there's always going to be vulnerabilities that can be attacked in the market. And I think that's going to create a healthy competition for years to come, even though I think the the big vendors will probably try to counter that by buying up the, the threats. So what happens if you purchase and implement a best of breed solution and then it is acquired? How does that change your experience as a, a customer utilizing the system? Well, we found that, you know, vendors usually have pretty ambitious plans to, you know, migrate those legacy customers over to their core flagship product. But we've also seen vendors have it backfire with their customers. I know, for example, when Oracle bought JD Edwards, there was speculation for years that they were just going to discontinue JD Edwards and move everyone over to, um, at the time, I think it was Oracle EBS and, uh, never really happened. It's sort of happening now. I mean, now Oracle's finally said, okay, we've got, yeah, we've got a roadmap, I think through 2030 for JD Edwards, but they're not looking much beyond that, which is sort of leading a lot of JD legacy customers down the path of, okay, well, we've got to figure out something other than JD Edwards now, if we're going to stay current, um, so that's that's a big thing that we're seeing is that that uh, you know the vendors are are pushing a lot of that a lot of that change. Absolutely, yeah that that makes a lot of sense. I can just imagine going through all of that 
implementation because you wanted a best of breed solution to be now be put in a, a situation where it's like, oh, I guess I am a customer of that huge vendor I was trying to avoid. But, you know, yeah. that's kind of that's kind of the life. So this question is more of a comment slash question. Um, it says, I'm confused. I never thought cloud would be more expensive. I thought it was put in the marketplace because it should be less expensive. Great question. And uh, it's, We're it's actually- We're confused as well. We're all confused. <laughs> yeah, we are. I think the industry is confused. And I think the industry would tell yeah, me that right. I'm confused because they don't like what I think about this or what I, what I see in the market. But um, you know, generally speaking, organizations are not going to cloud systems because they want to save money. They might be being, people might be telling them that they'll save money, but they're just not, they're not saving money. I mean, they, for every dollar they're saving by not having their own servers and maybe they're not having their own uh, internal IT maintenance requirements or skills that they have to maintain in house. Okay. Let's just say they save money there, which a lot of organizations do. Now they don't have servers. They don't have infrastructure. They don't have the IT staff that they once needed. That's fine. You save money there, but all you're doing is you're shifting those costs over to a new vendor now. And that new vendor is making money off you that quote unquote saving money, but you're not saving money. You're just shifting your spend from, from one um, place to another. And in many cases, in most cases, I'd say after five to seven years of using a cloud solution, after five to seven years, we see in most cases that the, the ROI sort of flips to where you're actually spending more on the cloud solution because now the subscription annual subscription costs just never go away. It's just constantly there. Whereas at least before, you know, with the on-prem model before cloud, you would just have one big capital expenditure up front, and uh, and then you had sort of your your smaller ongoing maintenance costs. But now the, the equation's flipped, and you're paying just a rather than having that big upfront capital cost and spend. Now you've got a higher ongoing operating costs. So. You've shifted dollars on the balance sheet. You've shifted dollars from one place to another, but you're probably spending more dollars. Now, that's not to say that the value is not there. It might be that that's the right thing to do to spend more money on a cloud solution because you're going to get more value out of it. That's a different discussion. And I think that's where a lot of people get confused is you can you, you have to first recognize you're not you're probably not going to save money by moving to the cloud, but you might deliver more business value, which means it's a, it's a more positive ROI. So that's the way. I'd, I'd view it. And, um, you know, I think cloud is just, a. It, it wasn't, I don't think it was ever created to save money. I think it was created to sort of centralize and, and create a, an easier way to deploy the technical side of technology. Yeah. Well, definitely well said. Um, and I think it just speaks to that, that phase, phase zero approach of understanding that total cost of ownership before you do engage in those contracts. And, if you missed it, we had Marcus Harris on a few episodes back talking about ensuring that you understand the contract language when it comes to this specific topic, the price of a SaaS or cloud-based software. So if you are kind of in that or you did ask that question, definitely head over to that episode and you can pull a lot of great tactics out of there to ensure that you at least understand what you're spending as opposed to being three years down the road and having no idea that you were going to spend more than, than you um, had, you know, initially uh, budgeted for. So, um, so great questions, definitely. And just a reminder that if you do, you can tag me at Kyler Cheatham on all platforms. It's the same name. Um, or you can um, tag third stage if you want to be included in the question jar. And each week we'll spend about 10, 15 minutes asking Eric all of um, your great questions. You can also put it in the comments wherever you're viewing today. Um, and I will go ahead and pull it out and we'll ask him some questions and definitely keep us laughing with those funny comments because I'll pull those too. So um, with that, Eric, I, I kind of want to turn and we have to talk about the FAA outage. There'd be no way that we could not cover that on ground control this week. Um, so I want to kind of dive into that for some background, you talked a lot about the the Southwest kind of IT implosion um, a couple weeks back and understanding around 2022 holiday travel, that disruption it created in the marketplace because of older or lagging systems or leapfrog technology and broken processes, that type of thing. So we, we kind of saw that expand on a more ironic level because the FAA here in the United States is responsible for regulating airlines. So they had been the most critical about Southwest and not being able to 
um, go through those IT outages smoothly and affecting the customer experience. Well, um, I don't know if you'd call it karma or just, you know, bad case of coincidences, but the FAA overall software system that they utilized had an outage um, last week on Wednesday morning. Uh, and because of that, all of the domestic flights here in the United States were grounded and really global travel was hugely impacted because of that system outage. So I want to kind of take you through the steps that happened and see if we can't kind of dive into if we can pull out some best practices in um, in a, a software maintenance or overall plan to ensure that those don't happen. So apparently the cause of it was um, a file that they ultimately found a corrupt file on the main system. Um, and they chose to reboot the system because it wasn't working on Wednesday morning, which led to a huge outage because the backup system was not able to handle the functions that the normal system handles. So just knowing all that piece of information, what's what's your reaction to that? Or, or what would have been something that you would have looked at as far as an expert in this field to ensure that that was never even a possibility? Well, I think a lot of it is, um, you know, sort of pressure testing the system and continuously improving the system. Um, you know, if you're if you're letting your system just sit and become stagnant, stuff like this happens, you know, there, the technology gets outdated or processes change, but the technology doesn't keep up or you create new integrations that that can add to vulnerabilities with the core system because now you're integrating it to other third party systems. So you look at all these different things that change over time. If you're not keeping up with advancing and testing and improving your legacy system, stuff like this happens. So I think that's the key thing is to have a continuous improvement mentality as well as a risk mitigation mentality. I mean, if you're a, a government oversight committee or an, a government oversight entity like the FAA um, is in the United States for regulating uh, traffic control for air for commercial airlines, um, that's that's a pretty big deal. You've got a lot at stake there. So, you know, it's even more reason to make sure you've got systems locked down and you've got a, a way to, to manage that and mitigate that risk. And with those kind of health check type of processes, how often should you be auditing your systems, testing them? What kind of does that look like from an overall risk management perspective? You know, from a continuous improvement perspective, which leads to, you know, to risk mitigation or it can lead to risk mitigation. Um, you know, one of the things you can do is is constantly, you know, as you're redefining business processes or improve it, improving business processes, you're also, um, you're also testing the system you know, in a, in a test environment for those new processes, new integration points, if you're going to, um, you know, change something materially in the system or make some sort of update, you want to make sure you're testing that. Um, so those are all things that can be can be done um, is, is to ensure that you're, you're continuing that continuous improvement mindset and, and con continuing to monitor that risk along the way. Absolutely. And so knowing that this was a huge outage, how does a business recover from this? Obviously, this is a very public and embarrassing um, overall uh, disruption for the FAA. But if you are a business, maybe even on a smaller scale, that have now created distrust with your customers or employees because of a technical outage or um, any sort of technical issue, what are some things that you can do as remediation tactics? Well, I think, um, I mean, first of all, you've got to figure out, you know, is this something we can fix in the short term in, in our current system? And assuming you can, then obviously you want to put a Band-Aid on it to, to stop the bleeding. Um, but more important, longer term is to make sure you figure out, well, what do we need to do here? Is this a replacement issue? We've got to replace the system or we need to do an upgrade or get some kind of security patch or whatever it is. So I think it depends on what the, what the problem is or what the breach is. It depends on what the technologies are using. But you want to assess really the lay of the land to do two things and do two things in parallel. One is to stop the bleeding. The other is what do we do longer term to make sure that it doesn't happen again, whatever the, the problem was. And do you feel like as an industry, we're just kind of seeing the global airline or air travel industry 
just completely implode because of these older systems? Or do you feel like it's happening a lot of places and maybe they're just getting the brunt of the exposure? Yeah, it's probably happening in more places than you think, just because, you know, what happens with a, a large high profile airline in North America or a, a large, you know, government oversight entity, you're just going to hear about it. Just like you hear about it when Hershey's has a big digital transformation failure failure or Nike has a big transformation failure. Um, you're just going to hear about it because they're bigger names. But for every one of those that are high profile, there's however many dozens of or even more uh lesser known organizations that are struggling with the exact same thing, but they just don't make the news because they're not a household name or it's not as much of a universal impact as it might be for say an airline. Absolutely. Well, you know, we, we say we'll continue to follow this, but um, it's something that, that seems to happen on a weekly basis here, at least in the, in um, North America, we did cover British airlines as well um, in our global segment last week. Um, so definitely go check that out. We talked about the Southwest IT issues and, and how, um, you know, going through a digital transformation is often forced because of these really high profile failures. So um, I think it's a, a great, you know, kind of segue into our theme of this episode and talking about the difference in public versus private digital transformations, how they're similar and how they can be, um, they can have specific nuances as well. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a, this will be a good conversation for um, people in multiple industries, whether you're in the private for-profit sector, or whether you're in the public government related sector as well. We're going to have AV and Megan from a company called Avero Advisors, which is a an independent consulting firm that helps public sector organizations with with ERP and digital transformations. They're going to be on the show with you and I to talk about digital transformation and best practices in private versus public sector, and you know, what are some of the commonalities and what are some of the nuances and differences. And it's a it's really good topic of discussion because I again, regardless of which side you're on, um, it, it really helps paint a picture of what digital transformation should look like and also what some of the pitfalls are that you need to, to manage or, or navigate. So it'd be great to have them on the show. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll bring on uh, Megan and Navy from Avero uh, talking about digital transformation best practices in uh, the differences between public and private sector. But first, we'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event. It's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices, about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed, you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com. Go to stratosphere2022.com, register. All you have to do is put in your, your name and email address, uh, just a few fields. You get immediate access to all the recordings and the recordings cover everything from digital strategy, um, software selection, organizational change, process improvement, architecture, data migration, cloud, trends in the industry, um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation. All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 Replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 104. My name is Eric Kimberling, here with Kyler Cheatham. We have new episodes of this podcast every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world, including Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, etc. So be sure to check us out every Wednesday. I'm excited for our next guest, uh, first time guests on the show. Um, AV and Megan from a company called Avero Advisors are going to join us. And we wanted to bring them on because they're, um, this is an interesting uh, discussion we're going to have because they're, they're kind of like frenemies, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're frenemies of third stage. They, they are similar to what we do. They're independent. They do tech advising, uh, tech consulting, uh, but they're focused on the public sector. 
Um, we at third stage do mostly private sector. We do some public sector, but not as much as they do. So there's a little bit of overlap in what we do. So technically we're competitors, but we actually met them and you, you in particular met them at, um, the Inc 5000, uh, gala or celebration that was a few months ago. And, and we talked about this on a previous episode that in 2022, uh, third stage consulting made the Inc 5000 list of fastest growing companies in America as did um, Avero. And so that's how we met them or how you met them. And, uh, we, we sort of built a partnership, uh, a frenemy based partnership where we actually, uh, we work together on multiple projects and pursuits and that sort of thing. So, uh, it's been a great relationship, uh, kind of uncharted territory for us. Cause sometimes you think, well, wait, are the, are they competitors or partners or both? I, I guess they're both. Um, so we're, we're kind of going out on a limb here to bring them on the show, but really good group of people. And, uh, people that we've, our two, our teams have enjoyed working together and it's been a great partnership so far. And I think it's a good fit for this audience here today. And so we want to bring them on and, and you're going to ask us a bunch of questions. You're going to ask uh, AV and I in particular, uh, some questions about the differences of public sector versus private sector, digital transformations and joining you to help with that conversation is uh, Megan from, from AV's team, team from Avero. So uh, with that all being said, let's uh, jump into the panel discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for having us on today. I'm Megan Seaton. I'm the business development manager for Avero. Part of my job is to brand build and share the story. So this is a great opportunity for us to do so. Um, at Avero, uh, we help carve the path to modernization um, for local cities and counties. So we focus more in the public sector space. Um, and today, obviously, I have our founder and CEO, A.V. And A.V., if you want to do your own introduction, I'll turn it over to you. Great job introducing me. I, I, feel, like a, I feel like a star on the show. Uh, you are. But, you are a star. No. No, that's <laughs> uh, But anyway, anyway uh, my name is Abhijit Barakar. I just go by, by A.V. Uh, and I'm uh, six, six years ago to focus on uh, digital transformation and ERP. And the public sector into the 21st century. So when we do IT strategic planning or transformations, uh, we are bringing our clients uh, from the 1970s, 80s, still have mm -hmm. green screens and AS400s and extremely broken process at the time 30, 20 years ago were cutting edge, but uh, our, our clients tend to be below. Uh, we saw a niche in that industry and, and our focus has been anything to do with public sector, cities, counties, states, uh, uh, utilities, school systems, uh, these public housing agencies, anything government, we, we help them modernize business practices through uh, business process redesign, mapping, and when logical uh, enhancements. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we're we're coming in and out a little bit, um, and sometimes that happens with the the live stream, um, AV. So sometimes we can pop you back out and pop you back in because we definitely want to hear everything that you're saying um, in that piece. And and it sounds like just building on on what those those ideas are that there are quite a bit of different nuances when it comes to a public versus private digital transformation. So let's um, let's dive into that. Um, so let's start with with you, Eric, um, while we kind of work on the AV audio um, situation. How's this? What are some? Yeah, so we we can hear you a little bit better now. So okay. let's talk about what are some reasons in which a public versus private digital transformation takes place. It sounds like in the public sector. Start sort of start with the private sector and then turn it over to AV for the for the public sector priorities. You know, in the private sector. It's, it's usually profit-driven, efficiency-driven, competitive advantage-driven. Um, I think there are, you know, in terms of the business value that organizations get in the private sector, I suspect that's quite a bit different. And in my impression is that's quite a bit different. Um, I think there's some similarities, though, too, for sure. Like um, A.V. mentioned that, you know, a lot of his modernization work that he does at Avero is focused on organizations that are still, you know, stuck in the 70s or 80s using mainframe, green screen sorts of systems. Um, I think that's somewhat true in the private sector as well. You get just really outdated systems in the private sector at times. And then other times it's just more, you know, they're on a 10 or 20 year old system. So I think um, my impression is that the private sector might be a little bit ahead of the public sector in terms of technological maturity and where they're starting from. Um, but I'm 
difference to see what you think, Gaby, in terms of where where the public sector is different in that regard. Yeah. Can you hear me? Is is this okay, Kyler? Good. Yeah, you're still coming in a a little bit choppy, but I think we're we're getting what what you're saying. Let's go for okay. it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, I think I think the trigger the trigger is no profit motive for our clients, and there is a, a uh, always to be more efficient, be, be more transparent, be more uh, with the time. The funding doesn't exist uh, a lot of times or because, because no one's asked for the funding. Sometimes there, there's a uh, you know negative inertia, so to speak, like your, your things are working at a very basic level, so why, why change? So the, the trigger points tend to be there's a new mayor in town, there's a new administration, there's a new schools director who have been elected. They've ran on this platform of becoming more efficient and becoming more transparent. They come in and and uh, sort of trigger point a, a, a change process. So it it's not always profit. And, and, and they'll talk about saving money and being more advances, but, but that that also doesn't tend to be the high, highest motivator. It's it more, more often than external uh, change, change that's mandated that uh, that some regulations telling them to things break and there's a cyber attack or that they, they just they're back to doing stuff on them. But really, there there is no profit motive in our clientele. Mm -hmm. That's that's interesting in in that piece of it. Um, in understanding that a lot of organizational pieces that you just mentioned, Av, are 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 big factors as well thinking about um, new public administrators or, or those types of things. So let's talk about um, that a little bit and kind of dig into that. And I know, Megan, you have some questions too. So I promise as the audience knows, I, I won't do all the talking. But when we look at things like organizational change and how those fit specifically, we know that that's huge on our side, number one reason of failure when it comes to digital transformation. How is that different on the public side. Um, so let's let's go directly to you, Av. Is that a huge factor that that you need to be aware of when it comes to um, organizational design or, or organizational factors when you're talking about bureaucracy and constituents and those different factors? Uh, the points of failure tend to be on the organizational side. It's, uh, lack of preparation, lack of an understanding of what you're looking for from the, it's easy to just dismiss this as buying new computers or servers or getting a new system. But I'm sure this is a commonality between the public and private sectors where uh, if you have a digital transformation process through and what the outcomes need to be and how your organizational, uh, what's required, um, then, then that can really really cause a, a failure more, more often than not as organization. It's not paying attention to how important project man uh, it is to set a global vision uh, um, for for what the, this project. That's that's really interesting. And, and Eric, if you can build on that, um, that would be helpful. And I know we're still having some audio problems. So thank you for letting us know in the comments. We'll continue um, to kind of troubleshoot that in a live, very non-stressful environment. So, um, <laughs> so just hang out with us for a little bit as usual. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and pop those in there. I'm going to get to some of what Basan's saying about kind of innovation and digital transformation here in a second, but I, I want to give Erica a chance to kind of um, talk to what that looks like from a, a public and private, just in your experience as well. Yeah, so I think there's, you know, you have, um, you know, internal organizational dynamics. I totally agree with AV that that's, I think, a universal problem or opportunity for both public and private sector uh, transformations. Mm -hmm. But I think in the, um, you know, in the private sector, you have, I guess, just different political drivers. It's more, you know, I feel like in the private sector, the political drivers internally that could undermine a, potentially a transformation is going to be, you know, people jockeying for you know, position or authority or, or jockeying for, um, you know, moving up the organization and, and 
generally speaking, the larger larger the organization, the more politics you're going to have, and the more complicated it gets in terms of those internal dynamics. So um, I'm not sure if the drivers or the causes of those internal politics and those internal organizational issues are different in the public sector, but certainly in the private sector, that's something that, you know, a more established, larger, more mature organization is generally going to have just more complexity in terms of the internal dynamics, the internal politics, the resistance to change, the highly tenured workforce, all that stuff. So there's probably, I would imagine, just more variety, I guess you'd say, in terms of the, what sorts of dynamics you see uh, in the private sector, just because there's so many yeah. different sizes of organizations and that sort of thing. But be curious to see what you think, A.V. Yeah. And, and is, is this better? Yeah, Sorry, actually, it is. <laughs> it is? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, uh, the driver point of difference in, in the drivers and um, what tends to sort of pull the boat forward is uh, is IT, right? The CIOs um, tend to be interested in change in the private sector, I think. Uh, in our case, the CIOs are interested in, in keeping things uh, conservative, uh, more secure, and then is that if you don't change, then you're then you're more secure. Uh, if you don't change, then things we're working at a very basic baseline, and we don't want to shake the boat too much. Uh, the CIOs don't uh, tend to be even if they are forward thinking. They don't want to take the rating a political storm by wanting to change systems uh, frequently or. In introducing change. Um, but I think from talking to you, Eric, it, it, it seems like uh, you guys market to have a, a solid partner in the, the IT organization where uh, uh, in is, um, we're dealing with the elected officials and top management that will tell the CIOs in the IT organization what needs to happen. Hmm. Do you feel like, I'm just curious, A.V., do, do you feel like in the yeah. public sector that people feel more secure in their jobs and their tenure to the point where they, they, you know, they can do things that might undermine a project and it's not going to have the same consequences as if you're at a private sector organization or what are your thoughts on that? It's really hard to fire somebody public sector. You know, they might, the, the worst consequence they might get is they get, or they get put on leave, but, uh, that's also a, a, it's not things right and, and do things as well the first time. So uh, the the more progressives that can easily be fired. So right. uh, there's always that right. But but then it also things better if they have a professional team like ours come in just just take on and manage the vendor. Man awesome. Sorry. The, and and yes, we don't have IT support this morning right before the live stream. Our systems went down. So yes. apologies. This is uh, this is a great case uh, for uh, the topic we're on. Um, yeah. So from a vendor's perspective, when a software vendor is listed in stock exchange, innovation is hindered. Case in point, uh, Epicor many years ago. Yeah. So we, I don't, I'm not sure about Epicor, but we have we have other uh, publicly traded mm -hmm. software vendors that, uh, you know, the pressure for them is to. Uh, make the stock price go up. The pressure is to have uh, solid financials every quarter. And I think what we've seen is they have lagged behind in terms of customer uh, service and the quality of the product. And you can easily blame that on being a publicly traded company, but I don't know if that's a generalization we can make. There's just one company that I can think of that that I won't name, obviously, that um, that we've seen falter really bad uh, because they're their focus has been on acquisitions and growth through acquisitions and growth through acquiring new clients. Um, and unfortunately, we, we see that a lot, right? We, we do a lot of RFP uh, reviews for our clients because we're independent, we're third party, just like uh, third stage. Uh, and our clients are government sector clients. So they have to release RFPs when they need to uh, uh, buy a new product. They can't just mm -hmm. go and buy something. So we are looking at proposals. There's a there's a county up in New York. Uh, we recently helped through the RFP process. Ten different proposals came in, and the largest of these vendors, who's very prominent in the public sector, their proposal had some other clients' names in it, right? And it didn't even pertain to what this client was asking about. They just like copied and pasted it. And for a publicly traded company, that's a very bad look. 
Um, and, and it's indicative of how badly that one vendor is treating their clients. Um, so yeah, it's not always uh, great that they're publicly traded because we've seen that that is, isn't always an advantage. Yes. And on, on that same topic, I feel like uh, um, here most recently we've seen not to bash any vendors, right? Um, but timelines, right? They come in and they say, we want to implement this software in six months. And it's like, what? Can you speak on that a little bit, A.V.? Maybe provide some examples on timelines and why that's a bad idea. Yeah, and I think I think that's a commonality too between our our practice mm -hmm. and, and third stages, where uh, the vendor community is, especially in ours, they're counting on our clients to not push back and ask the questions. They're counting on our clients mm -hmm. being um, sort of less educated in the whole process of uh, digital transformations and ERP implementations. So they'll throw things out to see what sticks. Uh, for example, a good example is how much to, you know, how, how long is it going to take to implement a um, tax collection system? And a very common answer is, oh, yeah, we can do it in six months without asking the follow up questions of, you know, what the nuances of your operations are, how many agencies are involved. The salespeople are incentivized to. Uh, get the signature on the dotted line, and then they disappear and leave it leave it to the project management team to solve. Who then come in and say, "Yeah, that's that's not possible," and what was sold to you isn't what we typically do. So there's a huge disconnect, and I I don't know what are you seeing similar things on your side, Eric? Yeah, yeah, I, we are, and it's it's that timeline's a big deal, you know, as far as um, being realistic about. I think in today's today's agile environment and, and today, you know, focus on speed and, and just, um, you know, trying to counter, because I think what, what happens in the industry is the, the ERP and digital transformation space has a, is notorious for projects taking too long, costing too much money, being failures, all that stuff. So the industry, the industry has responded by saying, okay, well, let's, let's do things that are more agile. Let's take an agile approach. So they'll mm -hmm. come in and say, Hey, we can do this in six months. We could roll out the technology in six months. We'll take this agile approach we'll do sprints all that stuff and not that there's anything wrong with agile but what it does is it creates a false impression or a false expectation that just by being agile and by leveraging agile concepts now we're going to be able to deploy we're going to be able to go through our transformation faster but the problem is it's not the technology deployment that slows down a transformation it's all the stuff that you were talking about Evie, the yeah. organizational stuff the operational stuff and agile doesn't really fix that if anything agile in some ways undermines that need to focus on improving processes and defining your future state and all that stuff. So yeah. I think that's a common challenge. I think I would think across both, both uh, public and private se sector. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, it, it, what we're seeing on our side is they're not even calling it agile. It's just a way for them to uh, push the risk on the client and, and get sign offs and things that don't make sense. Um, and when we are in the mix and we get called in to review the plans and, shepherd a client through an implementation process, um, we're called hostile because we're asking very basic questions of the vendor's project management team. Where is the project plan? Uh, how do you expect us to go live on a randomly picked day? Um, and, and that's when the, you can tell that they're used to treating the clients uh, in a certain way. And when a professional team is involved, uh, like ours or yours, when we start asking questions, that makes our vendor friends really uncomfortable. So I wish they would use terms like agile to at least put a put a veneer of we've thought this through uh, right. before they put stuff out there but they don't it sounds like they yeah. do on your side <laughs> yeah they yeah they they do i think that it's such a buzzy word you know to say mm -hmm. look we're yeah. going to take an agile approach and people mm -hmm. think oh okay agile that sounds good so you're going to solve the problem of projects taking right. too long and being complicated yeah. and all that stuff. right right absolutely and and speaking of agile a lot of times and those timelines in dedicating overall commitment to those, there's a lot of risk there, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of risk associated with transformation failures. We're here having a panel discussion with AV and Megan and Kyler and I talking about the differences between public sector and private sector digital transformations. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, 
experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 104. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham. We're having a panel discussion here with Megan and AV from Avero Advisors, talking about the differences between public sector and private sector digital transformations. Megan and AV, and we'll go to you, Eric, um, after. If you can kind of take us through what are some specific risks that are maybe more prevalent in the private sector or that you've seen with your project work? So uh, the most prevalent is, is uh, a political risk, right? We are, uh, depending on who we're working with, let's say we're working with a, with a county in rural Tennessee, um, you have to convince, I don't know, 20 plus county commissioners in a small county that a certain transformation effort is necessary. Now, go back to our initial thought on who is our uh, main point of contact, right? You, you can convince the CIO, you convince the CFO, you convince the mayor, and now they have to present this to this legislative body and you have to get buy-in from them. And that buy-in isn't constant because they're elected for four years and some of these projects take mm -hmm. four to six years. Mm -hmm. And now you have your support system that gets elected out of the office and is your project still going to be a go? That's like a macro risk. But uh, at a project level, it really tends to be uh, the speed at which we can move, right? And in the in the private sector, again, you have uh, profit motives. You have to meet your goals for production. Your inventory controls need to be tightened up. There's a real dollar amount that can be assigned to not having this project complete on time. On our side, it's more um, esoteric. It's more political. It's it's who's what are we going to be in the news? What is the press going to say about this? Who's going to vote for me if I uh, if if I have this public failure. So a lot of times failures uh, tend to be glossed over and you sort of have um, a longer uh, rope, so to speak, for failed project, which isn't necessarily good, right? Because you can, yeah. you can uh, just stick with bad processes, bad systems, just because you don't want to look bad. Um, so th those are some common, common themes and, and risks that we see. Yeah, that perception yeah, obviously is on a heightened level. So what about you, Eric? What what are some risks that you feel like are a little bit different in the, the public versus private sector? Well, I think it's super interesting to hear the, you yeah. know, the what what A V just said, because that's uh, <laughs> fascinating that it, you know, taking the safer route sometimes might be, you know, the the temptation in the public sector because yeah. you know, you're not risking as much. You don't risk of having a failure. Um, although, you know, like in the United States we had just, I think it was last week, the FAA, mm -hmm. the Federal Aviation, what does the other A stand for? Uh, I forgot. What FAA Authority? Stands. Agency? Yeah. Authority. Yeah. yeah. Leave it to the private sector, go. leave it to the public sector mm -hmm. folks here to help help me out on this. But <laughs> but the FAA in the United States, which regu regulates air traffic in the United States, um, they had a system outage, you know, and yep. Southwest Airlines in the United States had a system outage, although that's not a public mm -hmm. sector. The, um, I think it's a good reminder that there's risk to not modernizing your systems and mm -hmm. leaving things the way they are. It may seem like it's lower risk on the surface, yeah. but there's, you know, I think we're seeing in recent weeks, a couple of case studies in the, in the public sector and, and transportation related industry yeah. where, uh, what those risks are. Um, and I think that's true in the, in the private sector too. I, but I would say that, you know, I, the private sector is probably a little bit more likely to have made some more incremental upgrades over the years. They're probably a little bit further ahead mm -hmm. than the public sector. So, in some ways, it makes it, I don't want to say it makes it easier, but the the more incremental improvements that have happened over the years, presumably, if, if we, if I'm correct, that they happen more often in the public sector, generally speaking, then the, the transformations aren't as big of a leap for them. Whereas, you know, if you're in the public sector or any organization that's using, say, a mainframe based system from the 70s, jumping from that to like a full cloud based SaaS solution, ERP sort of solution. Um, that's just a big jump. And so there's more organizational risk and more pain that goes along yeah. with that. So 
Um, I don't want to say it's easier in the, bio, in the private sector, but I, in some ways, maybe it is. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe. Yeah, the, you know, the, our clients, if it, they they don't change very often, so they have the advantage perceivably of of leapfrogging bad technology, right? A lot of our clients, like the our local our hometown client here, is um, we took them from an AS four hundred to a cloud based ERP system over two two and a half years, but for that to happen, they had to overhaul their uh, ISPs, they had to overhaul the their network environment, they had to overhaul internal processes for backups and security. Uh, you can't just go because it it wasn't just an isolated ERP that was old. Everything was old and mm -hmm. they hadn't changed at all. So the the advantage of that was they could leapfrog um, bad ERP practices. Like, you know, 12, 15 years ago, you would have built something from scratch an army of engineers in their uh, data centers building it for you. They could go from an AS400 to cloud-based SaaS ERP system um, because that that's what they could um, uh, afford in terms of uh, monetary value and business processes. Uh, their IT staff had been around since, again, the 1970s um, and hadn't kept up with the time. So, And they were retiring. So it wasn't just the system that was being changed. Uh, it was the entire organization and way they thought about technology uh, that that was being changed. So leapfrogging bad technologies is an advantage, but at the same time, they couldn't they hadn't done anything incremental. So they had to really like burn everything to the ground and start over. Um, but yeah, we have some clients that that have done certain things. They've kept up to the speed with uh, security systems and emails and things. But a majority of the systems are still uh, at least in the 1990s. Mm. I love the question that just came through the chat because I think this is a huge topic when we're talking about end user training and in people's jobs, you know, they feel like uh, their jobs are on the line, right? When we go through this digital transformation. So the question is, how often do you find during testing or implementation that the skills gap is bigger than initially thought and employees need to be repositioned within the company or replaced? So whoever wants to take that question, I think it's probably that, very yeah. similar in both. And I think it's it's similar and different. I think, and, and I'm going to take a stab at Eric's world. You know, it's it's. Um, I think when you have a newer system that's bringing more automation and efficiencies, private sector clients may lay off and reduce headcount because it's cost saving. It's direct impact on the bottom line. In our world. Um, we've seen clients become more efficient in the sense that a, a, a really smart accountant who was doing data entry and triplicating and, and copying and pasting things into three different spreadsheets can now become more of a report um, analytics, uh, forward thinking strategic person. So we've seen those shifts happen where a client or a small city has been able to really take advantage of the, the staffing that they have uh, to make things more strategically important, and then if people are retiring, that had that were th their only purpose for not retiring was that they were the only people that knew, like the sun said, RPG three. The one person knows how to use it on an AS four hundred, and they are not allowed to retire because who is going to work it? We can't find people that can do that skill set. Um, but the the real positives that come out of a digital transformation process that goes all the way from you know, just modernizing networks and becoming more secure to a new ERP system, We the most impactful ones are where they can now take advantage of the smart individuals and workers that have previously been just, you know, doing copying and pasting and super clerical work. What are you seeing, Eric? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a super interesting question because yeah. um, I think maybe to back up even more, I agree with everything you just said, A.V., I think the big big challenge though that organizations have is that they don't think through that question you know to yeah. define for themselves what are we going to do with, what are we going to do with av's job and eric's job and megan and tyler you know how are their jobs going to look different what are their roles and responsibilities going to be i think too often we we give lip service or we see organizations give lip service to potential benefits and call it good and say for example you know av um guess what we're going to roll out this new technology and it's going to automate 30 percent of your job that you know, instead of having to manually go look for information now and, or manually process a PO or whatever the case may be, now you've got software or technology that can automate that. And, mm -hmm. you know, usually people position that benefit or that value as a, as a positive to, to 
employees, but oftentimes that's going to get perceived more often than not as a negative because you haven't told me what am I going to do with that other 30% now? You're telling me you're going to automate it, but what are you going to do? Are you going to cut my pay? Are you going to cut my hours? Are you going to cut my job? Um, Are you going to sign me other stuff that I have to learn and you haven't told me what it is yet and so I'm scared? So it's all Mm -hmm. those sorts of things that go through people's minds because they haven't defined where, what the skills are they have today, what the skills are they need for the future, and then they don't have a deliberate plan to transition. So it doesn't, it doesn't directly answer the question of, you know, what we typically see, or if it's, uh, the skills gap being bigger than initially thought. I think, Mm -hmm. I guess I would agree that yes, the skills gap is bigger than most organizations think, but more importantly, they don't even define what, what the gap is and how they're going to get there. I think that's the even more important question is how how are you going to, how are you going to close that gap, whether it's big or small or whatever? Yeah, we, we also see we also see that uh, there's a lack of understanding of what automation will mean, right? Mm-hmm. If if you were uh, running paper based processes in in our world, it's purchase orders, right? You need a pencil, you need a process for purchase order, uh, three different approvals, and I'm exaggerating, but um, when when you go into uh, government offices, organizations, and say we're going to redesign your process where we map it, right? We use IBM Blueworks Live and we'll map a process uh, with every decision box, every resourcing uh, box, every action box. And a 20-step process turns into a five-step process. And a lot of our clients don't understand. So if I'm not doing that copying of that spreadsheet and pasting it into this spreadsheet, who's doing it? Are you telling me, that I'm not going to be doing that, so I'm out of a job. Um, it's it's a process of educating them on what a modern system does. So a lot of times what we'll do is before they even put an RFP out, we'll do like a market scan, an educational demo with a vendor that is non-committal uh, from the client side to say, here's what a modern 2023 ERP system does and how automated this is. Um, and it just blows their minds because they they haven't looked up from their uh, green screen or their Excel sheet in in twenty years. Mm. Yeah, that's that's um, you know super interesting that fact and and I think it goes back to something that is a fundamental difference or another misunderstanding specifically when it comes to the public sector digital transformation and overall projects. You had mentioned before, Av, that sometimes vendors kind of create a copy and paste approach that mm-hmm. in the um, those kind of canned types of timelines, those canned templates, we hate the word templates, we never say it. Um, but when it comes to understanding specifically public sector businesses, are they all the same? Can you use that approach knowing that the same city and county of San Diego might be doing something that the city and county of Albany might be doing? Can you talk mm-hmm. to us about that misconception? It's um I, I would say it's it's 80 90 percent similar uh, it it's a city like you a city or a county exists to provide services to your citizens right uh, collect taxes make sure the roads are okay you have you have sheriffs or police officers that can communicate with each other and then on the internal side they need to make sure that you know the dollars they are spending are being recorded correctly that there's audit controls and there's proper reporting that's the basic uh, function of a of a public sector agency is to provide services to the to their citizens, and uh, what tends to happen is, uh, you know, if they don't have a long term strategy, that's when that's when you get these siloed systems and processes um, that don't necessarily connect to each other, and that's where they sort sort of lose the the mission, and again, if you don't have a global vision of where you want to take your organization. Uh, which is which is again a commonality, right? You, when you deal with your clients, the basic simple thing: why are you trying to do this, and why are you trying to modernize your systems, um, and why a specific tool set versus versus another? Absolutely. And and what do you think about that, Eric? And, and we see that a lot, kind of when it comes across industry, right? If you've worked in food and beverage, then you know everything about food and beverage. Yeah, I guess the is this is an interesting thread that I hadn't. Sp- I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, but what it, what it's maybe opening up to me a little bit here is that, you know, in the private sector, I suppose it's quite a bit different. There's a lot more variation, I would think, because, you know, whereas a city or local state federal entity has sort of its defined scope of what service Mm -hmm. it needs 
or should be providing to its, its stakeholders and constituents. Uh, yeah. Private sector is different in that there's no clearly defined scope. I mean, you, your strategy is constantly evolving. You're constantly trying to outdo the competition. You're trying to keep up with the industry and, and macroeconomic trends, all this, all these different things that just influence maybe the private sector a bit more. And there's just more of an open road, I suppose you could say, as far as how they go about running their business. Whereas in the public sector, it's sort of not predefined, but you know, you have a narrow scope. You, there's certain things that you just have to do. And maybe you just did a good job describing yeah. some of them. Um, so I think that probably creates less of a case or a less likelihood that you're going to have best practices or templates that could work off the shelf out of the box for any given mm -hmm. scenario in the private sector. Um, but I would think it's even challenging in the public sector, though, even though even though what you're saying it'd be is, you know, I think you said 80 to 90 percent of yeah. processes are similar. And, yeah, there's nuances and you know slight variations. But in those cases, um, are you seeing that you could still use in many cases like pre configurations or industry best practices or just sort of vanilla software? Do you think it's more likely that you can use that in the public sector than than in the private sector? I think so. And, and you know, we're I think my team's doing a great job of educating our clients on on that because it's easy for for a city, even like, you know, the the city we are headquartered in, the next door is a smaller city. And how different can two small cities in Tennessee be? But you talk to them and they're like, we're so unique. So <laughs> New York and San Diego, the people that are operating these cities, they uh, it, it's a lot of pride, right? It's city pride, mm -hmm. civic pride. So they don't want to be like San Diego. The Nashville does not want to be like New York. Um, so there's that plays into it a lot. But as consultants, our job is to tell them, yeah, all of that aside, you need to run your payables process. How different is it, right? And uh, we're seeing that getting get get a little better uh, with time because in in uh, the vendors take advantage of this too. Uh, here in Tennessee, we have one vendor that's legacy. Uh, that sort of somehow has the blessing from the state uh, and and everyone assumes that that is a state provided system and therefore must be better than anything else out there. Uh, we've got a similar situation in, in Virginia uh, where they have a system that most cities use that isn't very good. Uh, but the perception is that because we have Virginia cities, this is the one to use. So. A lot of it is perception, and I think the more we educate our clients and the more we um, help them understand that at, at a very basic level, uh, the blueprints exist. Now, your state or county uh, or comptroller's office may have certain restrictions and regulations on how things are classified or how things are reported back on. Uh, those nuances need to be configured for, but for the most part, um, and again, public sector is large. There's different kinds of agencies, right? If we're just talking small city to small city, the majority of the processes tend to remain the same. Mm. Absolutely. And and I think, um, and I, I know, uh, Megan, you, you definitely uh, know about this question um, as well. And when it in the overall public trust. So kind of move back to that hot topic, which is the FAA, which we'll go over in, in ground control next week, the entire kind of failure. Um, Gosan says that cybersecurity threats and data breaches in the public sector un really determine public trust, which is ultimately the need to be able to secure funding, right, for these bigger projects. So what's your reaction to that, um, AV, when it comes to big failures that could be, you know, that could determine the overall voting of your constituents, I would assume? Yeah. Well, in and, and loss of data is, is pretty real, right? We, we see a, a, a lot of cities and counties, they uh, they get hacked, uh, data is held for ransomware. And, and in most cases, it's older systems that have never been tested for backups, that have never been, they've just paid for things that, um, and we see this every day, you, they'll buy things that they are not uh, implementing 100%, not all the features are turned on. Um, they just don't have the infrastructure to uh, escape a, a cyber event in a in an efficient manner. So uh, that sort of taints the whole thing. So when you start talking about hosted solutions and software as a service um, and, and the cloud, the immediate reaction is how secure is it? Um, and then we have to dig into how secure they are currently, because if, if the baseline's not there, no amount of um, 
cloud security and sims and network monitoring is going to help you right so in the it's it's prevalent in the in the public sector they're getting better at it but also they're going at it from a from a cyber insurance sort of uh, standpoint which is they're assuming they're going to get um, a cyber event and now they're looking to uh, shore that up through a cyber policy which also opens another whole can of worms because uh, cyber insurance providers will cover you they may not pay for your claim because you don't have all of the uh, your ducks in a row and you haven't checked off everything that is not just technical but from a management perspective you don't have um uh, you know proper disaster recovery plans incident response plans you don't know who's in charge or who to call when a cyber event happens um, so there's layer i call it a the cybersecurity layer cake if you have one layer is it still a cake but you really need seven layers to make it real um, so cybersecurity is is something that's critical in uh, in our clientele yeah and i think just to build off of what av has said um sometimes not all of the time we do see a big disconnect between our executive leadership and our it departments right our executive leadership sometimes they don't know what questions to ask um, or how to communicate hey are, are we cyber secure are, are we secure you know and so i think helping them bridge that gap within the organization is key absolutely 100 percent. and love the food analogies definitely keep those coming because those are my personal. Right? But in, in knowing that, and we have a, a lot of dialogue in the comments. So thank yeah. you for um, continuing to do that. Just so, so you know, we will go back through and answer all of those um, too, if we don't get to your questions. And you're very right. Nashville and New York City are very culturally different. I think that's a big key takeaway is, is each um, city and county can be, each organization has its own subculture that's going to determine the overall success of that. We're here having a panel discussion with AV and Megan and Kyler and I talking about the differences between public sector and private sector digital transformations. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're gonna take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation? Then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 104. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham. We're having a panel discussion here with Megan and AV from Avero Advisors talking about the differences between public sector and private sector digital transformations. I want to go to Eric a little bit just to, to touch on the importance of that cybersecurity and that overall understanding of, of what those gaps in systems. We see a lot, and I'm not sure if you do, AD, AV um, and Megan, but it, we see a lot of best of breed solutions. So a lot of those interoperabilities within an organization and the need to kind of close those doors to cybersecurity threats. So I want Eric to be able to you know comment on, on what you're seeing as far as uh, those needs in our, our digital transformation projects. Yeah, I, I think cybersecurity is a big deal, you know, in both, both spaces. I think that's another commonality or area of commonality. I think the risk is a bit different and the, the visibility might be different. I'm not sure, you know, who the bigger targets are, you know, whether the bigger targets are in the public or private sector, I don't have a good answer for you there, but, but I, I think that in many ways, you know, the, the, the private sector, has more to lose in some ways, just because, I mean, anyone's going to lose, obviously, if they have a cybersecurity issue or incident. But I, I would think that in the private sector, especially larger financial services companies or even retail or, uh, or any organization that has consumer information, credit cards, things like that, um, there's just more at stake, I guess you'd say. Um, and I suppose that's probably true in the public sector, too. I might be oversimplifying or maybe I'm um, painting painting a bigger contrast than I, than there really is. But 
I think that's what private sector companies have to worry about is just the risk of, you know, if they have a breach, it's a big deal from a customer mm -hmm. perspective, a customer trust perspective, it could affect their profitability. And so back to the earlier question of what drives digital transformation and business value in public versus private sector, private sector has a lot of profit to lose if they violate yeah. that trust in public sector. It's maybe a different kind of a, a trust that's lost or different uh, negative business value that's realized yeah. from from a cybersecurity breach. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and they hold the same kind of information, right? If you're if you're collecting taxes or you're collecting uh, money for your uh, car tags or utility bills, especially huge risk factor um, there to have that data exposed. Um, mm -hmm. So when we do digital transformation, it's also a great time to see who's holding what kind of data, right? The the best practice, and or at least what we profess, is that as you're bringing in new systems. Uh, be very careful and sure of who's holding your data. If you're in the cloud, if you're running through a third-party payment system, who's going to hold ultimately the banking information, the the people's credit cards and and social security numbers? And the the smarter clients are pushing that risk off of uh, them to uh, to the vendors, and the smarter vendors are saying, "Yeah, we'll carry it for you for an extra price." So it's it's all in the design and again rethinking how you're how you're delivering services and what parts of this service should you be responsible for? Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. And, and if you missed it, we did talk to um, Brad Feeks a few weeks back when it comes to overall um, cloud security. So you can head over to our Ground Control podcast or our YouTube channel, be able to see that as well. One other thing I'll mention just on the, the public sector, do have some additional content for our global audience. Um, as well, when it's to additional um, transportation, we we talked about British Airways last week on ground control. Um, if you do have any examples of how globally you've seen um, public sector businesses uh, go through a digital transformation, we'd love to hear about it in the comments. So kind of keep that coming. Um, I I have a, a a question when it comes to public sector. What essentially would be your metrics for success? What is your ROI when it comes to achieving a successful digital transformation? It, like you said, it's not really profit driven, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to hear kind of what your clients, what are they trying to achieve mostly? Yeah. And how do you help them kind of hone into that and, and achieve that alignment around it? Yeah, so great question. ROI is hard, hard to define um, for our clients because, you know, you're not going to suddenly collect more taxes because you have you might you might pick up on the ones that haven't paid in a long time and and uh, therefore collect more, um, but it really depends on how they define it and they usually don't. So it goes back to why are we doing this? What's the trigger event? And it can be as simple as the old thing broke and now we're back on or more more transparent, more automated, um, and. If they ask us to, we'll define it for them. There's a lot of assumptions that get built into it, right? What does, what would uh, it, how much time did it cost you um, to create a purchase order in the past? And now how much time does it cost you uh, with the new system? So for example, a client of ours uh, that was using an AS400 green screen uh, for their ERP, it would take them a week to two weeks to just go from, I want to buy a box of pencils, to the department director saying yes and sign offs and they would send pieces of paper through inter office mail to the other buildings so that someone else could sign it. And that process went down to about one hour, assuming everyone's at their desks or on their phones and paying attention. So how how good is that for ROI, right? So we were able to, you know, assign some dollar amounts to that and just you don't have to be a whiz to to understand that there is a return right there. So in our clientele, it tends to be stories like that. It tends to be um, assumptions on how much time it took to run a certain process in the past versus now. And it's really immeasurable, right? Because they're, again, very well-meaning, smart people that have been bogged down by a, a lack of modern technology. And they didn't know how to start thinking about this. Um, and to see them uh, do things in a more automated fashion after we've gone through this whole process of digital transformation is very satisfying to me. And I think that to to us is internal ROI for Avero, 
um, but also on our client side, it, it's it's a great story to tell when that person that was just running around with paperwork has now uh, got time to like sit back and become more strategic and um, and think about the future rather than just chasing Excel sheets all day. Yeah, that's really well said, Eric. I don't know how you're going to follow that. Yeah, but, no. yeah, that was. I've got nothing, you know. If you... You, you you need a points counter, you know. I need I need I know. to know how many points. Yeah, yeah, we're keeping yeah, score. I'm I'm here for points, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I I think you know that's something that certainly translates in in our world for doing both pub- public and private sector work. Um, so Eric, how do you help a company define the measure for success when you're sitting down, you're talking about project strategy, and you're making sure that you have that alignment and commitment? Um, how do you help businesses really kind of pull that and define it? Well, I think in some ways it's it's easier for the private sector for a lot of the reasons that Evie just mentioned. I mean, there's there's not a, and we talked about this earlier too, there's not a, a traditional ROI calculation that you might do in the public sector, or at least it's going to be harder to do because how do you, you know, you can quantify a lot of what Evie just said. It's difficult, but you could quantify, you know, the efficiency gains and what do you gain from having someone, you know, streamline their process how do you, what do you gain from um, employee morale being higher potentially because they've got better tools mm-hmm. they're not frustrated, you know, trying to fight an uphill battle against their technology. And someone in the, uh, somewhere in the comments here, someone mentioned that staff turnover is a good measure. That was mm-hmm. one of the comments from, from LinkedIn here. And I think that's, that's something you could point to and say, you know, that's, that's a positive ROI. If we can decrease attrition and employee satisfaction is higher, there's some value there. And the private sector though, I think it's even it's even more important because in the private sector, in my opinion, you have no excuse not to figure out what the ROI is because it, you are profit driven, you are driven by cash flow, And that's your, you know, as an organization, that's generally the top, you know, the top priority, whereas public sector is a little, a little bit more complex. Their, their goal is not to maximize profit. That's just not what they do. And so private sector, if you can't calculate an ROI or you don't focus on ROI, I'd say you're not doing your job. I think you need Mm -hmm. to be looking at what the ROI is. Yes, there's certain business value, business drivers that are harder to quantify than others. Some you can't quantify. But if your only reason for going through a transformation is because you have to, because you have to replace your technology and because SAP or Oracle or Microsoft or whoever told you you have to get off an old legacy system, that's not a good enough reason. That might be the reason you're doing it. That might be the impetus, but you still have to define where the expected business value is not just to justify the project, but just to give you sort of that guiding North star of how you're going to manage the project and what is it we're trying to accomplish with this transformation beyond just replacing technology. So I think ROI is super important in the, in the uh, private sector for sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, well, I know we have just a few minutes left um, with the team here. So just want to get to a few additional questions. And just a reminder, if you put your questions in the comments, we always go back and answer all of the questions. Um, so uh, so I want to get to this one because this is really interesting. And I'm so sorry, I can't see your name. It just says LinkedIn user. Um, but specific public sector, almost all organizations have a risk management management division or department, yet more often than not, they're not involved in transformation efforts. The whole concept of, quote, compliant by design is completely foreign to them. I know when risk risk management is involved, it reduces costs of poor quality, thus reworking the design. Um, so I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on this specifically, and maybe even digging into the factor of compliance. Right. That, that I assume that's a, a big thing in your world as it is in the private sector. Um, but I wonder if you could kind of elaborate on that. So let's, let's go to AV first on that. Sure. Um, yeah. Risk, risk management is, is an important function within our clients. They, uh, you know, when we when we do our contracting, it's such a long process. And, and this one, Eric, can get a point on because our contracting um our contracting takes a long time, but risk management uh, is involved because they want to make sure we have the right uh, insurances and things like that. So, so that the county or the city is compliant on projects, uh, they tend to be not involved as much. But you're right; they should be because uh, when you're selecting a vendor uh, that's that's cloud based, how do you make sure that they're compliant with your uh, organizational practices, with your expectations for cybersecurity and risk management, and um, 
they tend to reduce uh, the risk of bad quality for sure. But in my experience in, in our clientele, they are very focused on just the insurance and bonding requirements. And they haven't evolved to the point where they're asking the real critical questions of a software vendors from a risk management perspective. But I think it's getting there slowly. Eric? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, risk management is more important with um, publicly traded and, and larger uh, private sector enterprises, I would say. Um, and so that's a that's a big um, risk management's a big deal for them, partly because there's compliance issues, but also partly because they just have more at stake and they're usually more um, sophisticated and mature in their ability to manage risk. But I think there's a lot of lessons that, you know, the mid market and even smaller uh, private sector organizations could learn from the public sector and from larger private sector enterprises in terms of risk management. And uh, back to the ROI question, you know, one of the equations of ROI is obviously cost. And if you can mitigate cost and risk during your deployment and after your, your transformation, um, that's certainly going to deliver an ROI in terms of lower cost and uh, reducing that risk of having the, the project plan and the budget get out of control. Yeah, and I, I just want to comment on, um, sorry, Kyler, I didn't mean to oh, cut no. you off, but I just want to comment a little bit on the um, RFP solicitation. So part of my job is is to look um, for RFPs uh, for Avero to respond to. And I think just to make a, a brief comment, I think sometimes uh, they can be too compliant, right? And so our, our public sector clients, they limit themselves uh, to what kind of business they can actually do because they haven't revamped that compliance process. So, good yeah, point. that's an excellent point. Really, really good point um, for sure. And, and we all know that the most expensive part of a digital transformation is the RES. Right? We took that from yeah. um, Tim Creasy over at um, ProSci. That's redo, redesign restructure. And that's a lot of times where we're coming into implementations that have failed or on the yellow path to fail. Um, so definitely so important to have that information solidified enough up front. Um, so as we kind of round out, I always like to ask Eric this question, AV. So I'm going to ask it to you and see if you answer the same to him. So no pressure whatsoever. If you're sitting in a room with a client, what that's getting ready to go through a digital transformation or are contemplating what that's going to look like for their, um, their public sector business. What is the number one piece of advice that you typically give to them in knowing that this is going to be a long, arduous process? What's the kind of the one thing that you would say, do this if nothing else? Um, make decisions. Like if I'm talking to the sponsor who tends to be, you know, on a financial ERP implementation, typically a CFO, make decisions. Don't be afraid to make decisions because there will be times, um, especially with, with our government clients, which everyone is, right? They make decisions by committee. So if there was one thing I would say, be a strong man, at least for the, or woman for the, for the next um, year and a half so that we can get this thing going and moving along. Very good. Very good answer. What about you, Eric? Well, I think just, just building on that, I think, you know, the, um, the alignment, you know, not only making decisions, but then getting the team aligned, because I would think, I would think in the public sector, you're less likely. And, and first of all, you're, you're unlikely, you're highly unlikely in any organization to get a unanimous agreement on major decisions that need to happen. Mm -hmm. But I would think in the public sector, perhaps, I'd be curious to see what you think, A.V., but uh, I would think in the public sector, you're less, even less likely to get total alignment and total clarity of direction, partly because mm -hmm. of, you know, elected officials, the, the internal politics mm -hmm. and the things talked about earlier yeah. um and in partly because there isn't the clear uh profit motive that most private se or public sector i'm sorry private sector organizations have so i think that um, that in some ways helps in terms of creating that alignment but even in, in the private sector it is difficult the, the larger the organization is is and the more stakeholders you have the more employees you have the harder it is to get, ever, get everyone on the mm -hmm. same page but i think that's really key too is just really sort of greasing the wheels with yeah. not only good solid decision making but also once those decisions are made making sure that you've got clarity and direction and so you're all you're all aligned heading in the same the same direction yeah, yeah one of the, the there's I, a, sorry go ahead go ahead. sorry um, i was i was just going to say one of the things i hear av say all the time when we're in the room with the client is um make sure you have a clear vision right what is it that you want as the executive leader or the leader of this project 
what is it? What do you want out of it? And I think knowing that from the top down and communicating that to your employees is key as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Alignment alignment is key because, you know, there's also a perception in our world that the rank and file workers will outlast the elected officials and, the, and therefore the appointed directors. So there's incentive and really no repercussion in uh, slow rolling it. So setting the vision and making sure that, you know, because you can't fire people easily, you, there is no profit motive. This is now a case study and how do you motivate people to do something really difficult that, that doesn't impact their bottom, their personal bottom line um, immediately. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you motivate people in that, in that very easy to answer one sentence question? But it seems as though that's, um, that's a necessity right? For this, this type of thing, it's going to be the only reason in which the project is going to be successful. So what are some tactics that specifically in thinking through as a public sector business that you can do to create that motivation or that internal buy-in? I think that that's when we put on our therapist and Tony Robbins hats, right? And, and uh, understand what motivates people and find those leaders at every level that will take this on for you for a more esoteric reason um, that they want to, you know, being in public sector, they're, they're making a choice to, um, in many cases, make less money than they would on the outside. So there is that strong public service sentiment that we tap into and help people uh, align themselves with the project. Uh, if someone's about to retire and they've been like, why, why are we doing this now? I'm leaving in two years, could you not have waited? we can then roll this into their legacy as you know, before you retire, don't you want to leave this place in a better place? Uh, if it's a new employee that has just come into the workforce, this is your chance to make this place better. Do, do you want to keep working on an AS400 for 30 years? No, but let's do this. So there's there's a lot of nuance and our, our team is pretty good at uh, the motivational part. Um, as consultants, this is probably a similarity. We We are practitioners of um, a very specific craft, but also we have to be good therapists without being licensed for it and without, um, you know, being clinically good at it. We have to be therapists at a very basic level because this is hard. This is hard stuff. Absolutely. Is. That, um, and That and, understanding is yeah. so important too, that listening yeah. and understanding where people mm -hmm. are and where they're going and where the pains are. I think that's a great, great point. Well said. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we often um, refer to our change management practitioners as um, industrial psychologists because that's really what they have to do, right? Um, that's absolutely key. And what I'm hearing is that we're going to need to do a second session with Eric and A.V. and Megan um, about the importance of organizational change and overall industrial psychology in public versus private sector. So we, we certainly, we're all voting and we vote for a regular so we so appreciate you joining us today and um, sharing your insights so Megan where can we learn more about Aveo or how can we get to know you guys a little bit better yeah absolutely by following myself uh, Megan Seaton or uh, AV on LinkedIn we also have an Avero advisors LinkedIn page um, please visit our website averoadvisors.com um, we have links to our YouTube channel there. Um, a lot of great videos, a lot of great storytelling, client stories. Um, so, yeah. All right. Thank you, Megan, Kyler, and AV. Great conversation. A lot that we covered in that conversation about the similarities and differences of private versus public sector, digital transformations. We've got a lot more we want to unpack from that conversation. But first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success.
Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 104. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Tyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, streaming every Wednesday morning, U.S. time, afternoon, and evening in uh, Europe, Asia, Pacific, etc. Um, you can also find us with new episodes on audio podcast platforms throughout the world every Wednesday as well. So, Kyler, we just had this conversation with A.V. and Megan joining us from Avera. What were some of your thoughts from that conversation? Yeah, well, I mean, I learned a lot. I didn't know. I mean, like you said, we do work in the public sphere. Um, so that is part of our engagements here at Third Stage. We just don't, it's not what we um, do all day, every day, as the Avero team does. So they have some additional insights that I certainly learned um, over there. I, I think I had it a little backwards. Um, I thought that they were going to be more about process and structure and hard technical needs as opposed to more of kind of the social, emotional, cultural needs that we see that are important in digital transformation. But I assumed government, which, you know, can, can, can um, traditionally be pretty regimented, that that wasn't going to be as great as a need. But it sounds like it might be even arguably more of a need because of just overall um, lack of other metrics and milestones when it comes to a typical private, quote unquote, sector project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of interesting nuances and lessons there for sure. Um, you know, one of the takeaways I had too, in addition to what you just said, is the um, the fact that best practices and pre-configured solutions are more likely to work in the public sector in many cases because they're more similar than the private sector. And I never really thought of that. I just as a backdrop, I don't think I mentioned it in the uh, last segment or in the in the panel discussion, but I, I don't have a lot of experience with government, which is why that that was such a fascinating conversation for me. We have people on our team that have a lot of government experience, but I, I just personally don't. So I learned a lot from that conversation, one of which was the, I guess, the, the more commonality or similarity between different government entities, um, which I think is a, a really interesting point as well. Absolutely. It's like, it's common, but it's not. It's common, but you can't really say that out loud. Um, it sounds like um, in right. in the other and just the overall um, heightened, I would almost call it emotion um, when it comes to working with a, a government organization, because there is a lot of pride involved in that. It's, it almost reminds me of a live stream I did a while back with um, our small business specialist, Christy Barber, who talked about multi-generation family businesses. It kind of reminded me along those lines of uh, the Jedi mind tricking, if you will, that needs to happen when, you know, setting them up for success because there is such a layer of overall um, dedication, both personally and professionally. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it's really interesting too um, that they were talking about the challenges with vendors or specific software vendors. Mm -hmm. We obviously talk about that a lot and the importance of understanding the agendas. But I guess I, I thought that maybe working in such a, a very similar industry, especially when talking about city and county um, solutions, that it would be kind of just a plug and play approach um, but it sounds like they experience a lot of what we experience as well and just having to be that kind of unbiased third party that truly is dedicated to the um, the overall entity's success, not so much the vendor's success. Yeah, it was interesting to hear that, you know, I, I would have thought that maybe it's just something we see in the private sector, but in the public sector, you know, through their more advanced and more uh, rigid procurement processes and contracting processes that maybe they'd have it all figured out, but it sounds like they really don't, you know, some of the same challenges exist in, in both private and public sector in terms of vendor behaviors and things that vendors do sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally that can derail a, a digital transformation like that. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to bring in, um, you know, a few more parties to have that overall panel discussion. Uh, it's a, uh, on the Avero team, we have um, some of their leadership team, and then also Greg Benton, who is our chief strategy officer here at Third Stage as well, um, who is really in charge of our overall um, business development side um, and overall delivery side as well. So I think it's it's a great conversation to kind of showcase the need of independent advisors in the marketplace. Yeah, and we thought it'd be great to play you this segment. I, I mentioned. Uh 
before that, uh, before we brought on AV and Megan onto the show, I mentioned that uh, Avero is sort of like frenemies where Avero and third stage are, are sort of frenemies of some overlap, some competition, but also collaboration and partnership. And uh, we actually met them at their offices, uh, Greg and I, uh, Greg Benton, who you mentioned, and myself uh, from our team were in uh, Tennessee, where they're based, where Avero is based. And we met with them. And while we were there, we thought, hey, why not? We're both, you know, both AV and I put out content on YouTube and video content. Let's do a joint collaborative thing. So we filmed a uh, sort of a panel discussion with AV, myself, Greg, and uh, I think one or two of his other uh, team members at Avero. Just talking about just gen in general, you know, what is the value of independent technology uh, or digital transformation advice and what is some of the, you know, sort of the top of mind advice that we give to people from an independent technology agnostic perspective. So we just want to put our heads together and answer a real simple question, which is what advice do we give to clients that are about to go through a digital transformation? So you get two, two companies or leaders from two companies that are independent and technology agnostic and you know, what do you get? And that's what we wanted to showcase so we we filmed this video we want to play you a clip when we come back but first we're going to take a quick break you're listening to transformation ground control if you are aiming for transformation success turn to third stage consulting group third stages independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 104. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. Thank you for joining here today. We're going to play you a clip of a video that uh, AV and myself, so AV from Avero, who was just on the show a moment ago, myself uh, and Greg Benton, who is Third Stage's Chief Strategy Officer, uh, we had a chance to meet in, uh, in person and film this clip just to talk about independent digital transformation advice and lessons and tips and best practices, all that sort of stuff. We thought it'd be cool to collaborate with another industry peer that's also independent, technology agnostic, and put our heads together and see what we come up with. So I want to play you this clip, and then we'll uh, come back and discuss uh, some of the takeaways from it. So because we work in the same industry for different kinds of clients, um, I think one of the threads of discussion in the last couple of days has been the, the difficulties that our clients face in uh, selecting product because there's a lot of noise out there. They don't know where to turn to ask the right questions because you know our vendor friends have a lot of dollars for marketing and, and the industry is flooded with information on why their product is the best product. Um, and where we fit in both our companies is, is how we help our clients pick the right products for their operations. Um, so, what are what are you guys seeing in terms of who's in charge uh, on your side on the private sector? Uh, who's running the running the show uh, when you get engaged on 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 the private side? Who's your client? It's usually the CEO, or I'm sorry, the CFO or the CIO. It's usually one of those two. Occasionally, it's a COO. Mm -hmm. um, what has your experience been? Those, it seems like uh, very often led by the uh, the CFO. It's a financial decision, right? Yeah. And the organization needs to follow a vision. So the COO gets involved. The, uh, the CIO very often is an integral part of that because you've got the technology component as well. So uh, I, I would say that it's kind of a, a unilateral yeah. um, approach, but in the past, it's traditionally been led by the CIO and uh, that is rapidly changing. Yeah. And that's been our experience too. Most of our ERP selection uh, projects are run by the CFO's office, and 
those are the good ones. I mean, we we we're frequently challenged when when it's the CIO calling the shots um, because they don't quite understand the business and what it what it involves. So it's very uh, common that they're they're they fall for shady sales tactics or or bad decisions or bad contracts that are completely not in favor of the client. For example, paying uh, licensing fees up front is what's commonly put in the contracts that our clients face, and, and a lot of them just do it. What, what, what are you saying? Oh. It's a huge blind spot that CIOs have to be aware of that um, you have the technical understanding. Um, the vendor is going to come in and tell you this is going to work perfectly well for your workflows. And one of the problems with IT is they are not the end user of this system. I don't care how much help desk support you provide on it at the end of the day you probably don't understand the workflows, the basis of the workflows, what would be a good set of requirements. And so it's easy to go, I understand the technical aspects of your product, looks great on paper to me, this is exactly the vision where I wanna go. The vendor's telling me they can take care of all my workflows, let's just go for it. And and when they go for it, uh, we typically see that, the, again, the definition of what success is, uh, isn't always clear. Uh, is that also common? within your clientele? It is, and it's also a step further than that. It's actually, you're incentivized to not succeed if you're a software vendor, because if you think about it, the way I succeed is if I can make more money through services right. and software. It's very rare that you uh, you start off with a solution that's uh, referring to one vendor as the the choice for your digital transformation as an organization. You're really looking at several different software vendors, you're looking at different systems integrators, you're looking at you know, a, a plethora of different components coming together to achieve that digital transformation, right? And so depending on a vendor or uh, a, single, a single entity like that to help you make your decisions about which direction you should go as an organization doesn't take into account all the other areas that you need to be looking at in terms of you know, what is going to go forward most properly for your business. And I, I think that's where a lot of the technical decisions about what is our digital transformation strategy going to be have failed in the past. And that's why it really does take the business and the IT side of the organization coming together and saying, what do we want to ac accomplish as a, as a business, as an organization that is going to better the way that we, uh, we operate, right? Yeah. And, and, that goes a little further with our clientele because the mission isn't always the same. It's not, let's make more money or let's save more money. It's uh, if they're working with a public safety department, like police department, whole other set of objectives. Um, we have a client that um, is a police department that relies on the city's financial system to get payroll data, right? And this new chief told me that he can't get the city's finance department to tell him why his department spends $500,000 a month on overtime. They can tell him that. They can't go into details on how it's broken down, who's doing more overtime, none of that. And how crippling must that be for, for an administrator that's trying to uh, make things more efficient and more transparent uh, while being under fire by the media and the public just for being the police department. So nuances within uh, um, motivations and objectives are, are very different than, than just saying a manufacturing. I'm not trying to uh, make it a lot simpler than it, than it is, I understand that. But the point is that different systems for different processes and different uh, organizations and functions uh, exist, best of breed. But the point is uh, you can't always, because you're so siloed, if you're only working with police departments, and finance is only working with finance, they don't know what the what the tentacles are that go, need to go into each other's processes. Uh, and that's a classic example of uh, why all the functional areas need to be at the table, at least telling you what their requirements are so that companies like ours can integrate all of that and tell the vendors, here's what we're looking for. Uh, because a department head or a functional expert in one area cannot know what finance uh, may need to know about their processes. And the same thing goes for, for CIOs and IT. They understand their, their trade really well, uh, but to understand the nuances of a public safety officer or a fire department or per permits department, it, it's very different. 
Well, and, and the risks too that a chief encounters every day. Chiefs will tell you that they deal with unique risks, obviously, that other people in the organization don't even deal with, even if it's a city manager or it's a mayor. And so they feel like there's only a certain type of mindset that's going to understand what I'm doing and what I need to have done and the information I need to have. And it's amazing. You'll find a lot of organizations, even large local governments, where the finance director and the chief never talk. They never really interact other than just for setting up payroll for something in particular. And so then the police department goes down this road of procuring their own system and doing things their own way without at least having some sort of a conversation with finance to see if there's some sort of efficiencies that can be done with using an existing uh, product that's there or going towards a product that's going to work for both of them. It's the breaking down of those silos that even if they're in the same building, like in a small town, yeah. those silo walls are very strong and, and very high in local government. Well, and we, when you think about change management too, that's a difficult part of it because because now in a transformation like this, you're asking people or in many cases demanding people see outside of their silo. And so that creates fear and anxiety and uncertainty when you don't have those those answers. And you also talked about the sort of the politics. You didn't use the word mm -hmm. politics, but when you've got media and police chiefs yeah. under fire and that sort of thing, it's a little bit different in the private sector, but, but similar too in that you, you don't have the same political, like external political dynamics as more internal politics. Right. And then, you know, we've had situations where you have clients that are infighting, you know, the leadership team doesn't get along and they don't see eye to eye. And then they try to go through this transformation and wonder why it fails. Well, you're going to fail no matter what, if that's your situation you're trying to implement it. Absolutely. Even though it's, you know, back to our point earlier, it's not just a technology project. You've got to deal with that human piece of it. If you're not aligned as an organization, the project's not going to succeed. And so I think you bring up a good point about politics and internal politics, external politics is all, it impacts all mm -hmm. kinds of organizations. Yeah. And, and, Leadership plays a big part, right? In, in a private organization, I, I assume, like ours, you and I can lay down the law and say, no, this is how we're going to do things. Right. In our clientele, it's not the same. There's multiple power centers. Um, we had a time and attendance project uh, we were trying to help the city with that they ended up scrapping because they could not agree on the policy of how to deal with, for example, cigarette breaks. You know, you're entitled to a cigarette break if you're a smoker, but if I'm not non-smoker and if I just go hang out outside for 10 minutes, I'm frowned upon. No breaks. No breaks. So uh, how do you translate that into a time and attendance system and how to track those minutes? And the other thing that the same project uh, uh, struggled with, again, wasn't anything we could have done because they could not agree on a policy is the fire department has a policy of their, they define their workday as being 24 hours and 10 minutes. 10 minutes to change over. But every system vendor was like, we can't, no system can do that. And unless you change the policy, you're not gonna have automation because again, 24 hours and 10 minutes doesn't exist for a computer system. Okay, we're playing a clip of a panel discussion that we did in person with AV and his team from Avero talking about digital transformation, best practices and lessons. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're gonna take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 104, where we're here playing you a clip of a panel discussion regarding independent digital transformation best practices and lessons. Let's continue with the conversation. So on, on the private manufacturing side, have you ran into some of those issues? Oh, well, I mean, especially talking about the silos within yeah. the organization and different departments, different work streams, not really communicating with each other. 
I think it goes back to uh, you know what is what is the the way of embarking on this digital transformation path. It's bringing the executive piece of the organization into alignment, but it's also making sure that you're empowering all of those business units, all of those departments within the organization to see how they're going to interoperate and see how they're going to sequence the new technology too, because you may have old systems that really need to remain where they are for a period of time. So they may not be considered right up front as something that's gonna be consolidated in the new digital transformation, but you have to factor in when they're gonna, when they're gonna come in, right? So it's getting back to that general contractor idea. When do you bring in the plumbers? When do you bring in the, you know, the, the drywallers? Um, bringing everybody in to build the whole house, you need to be able to coordinate that. And that really requires an internal program management capability that many of our, our clients don't have up front that we are able to lend them right. through our experience. So very similar from public sector to private sector uh, that is definitely what we see as, a, as an approach that needs to be taken. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in, our, in the government sphere, the, the vendor community is, is, has been pretty static for a long time. There's been a lot of M&A. Uh, Tyler Technologies has, has purchased a lot of other smaller vendors. Um, so typically what we see when we work with a client to uh, build an RFP requirements and put it out there, help coordinate the process, we'll typically see for a medium to uh, medium large type of agency, uh, three or four common vendors that come into bid. Uh, one is Tyler Technologies that that is like the predominant 800 pound gorilla in the market. Uh, the second one is Harris Technologies uh, out of Canada. They've, they've got some pretty good offerings. They've uh, they've generally sold this product called Gems. Um, now they've, they're selling a much upgraded product called um, uh, City View, and that includes ERPs, permitting, document management, the whole thing. Uh, we also see Central Square, which used to be SunGuard. Uh, they're now Central Square, and they're they're pretty predominant uh, in a lot of our clients and a lot of our uh, prospects that we're talking to. And then you tend to see the smaller players like MyGov Online or eGov um, uh, that don't quite have the foothold uh, to be everywhere, but they're they're playing. Um, and then you'll see the Oracles and the SAPs that 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 a SI is trying to pitch to our client and say we can build you something from scratch. Then they tend to be three or four times the price because. I think where the industry's gone so far is software as a service. Of course, we talked about how that's more beneficial to uh, the salespeople, um, but it's also beneficial to our clientele because they don't quite have the infrastructure or the manpower to take on on-premise uh, large systems. So it's worked out for them. As long as the vendor community keeps up their end of, of the bargain, I think it's a good deal, but we've also seen that more often than not, they don't. Uh, who are some of the major players in, 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 in the playgrounds you play in? Well, in the private sector, a lot of our clients are in manufacturing and distribution, um, occasionally retail, construction, um, financial services, and other industries. But across those industries, the, the private sector industries that we work in, you see a lot of uh, SAP S4HANA is becoming uh, more and more common. Uh, you have Oracle Fusion Cloud, uh, Microsoft Dynamics, and NetSuite are actually two of the most commonly implemented systems with, with our client base. Uh, but actually, an SAP is right in there, too. It's probably SAP, Microsoft, and NetSuite, I believe, are our three most commonly recommended and implemented systems among our client base. But there's, to your point, there's a whole host of dozens of other yeah. vendors ranging from, you know, focused SaaS solutions to industry-focused solutions to... Um, upstarts and open source concepts or open source uh, systems. So there's a lot of a lot of options out there, and I think a lot of times organizations assume they just need to go to one of the big names that they yeah. recognize because they saw the they see the banner at the airport or they watch the PGA Tour uh, yeah. golf tournament and they saw the ads and they think that that's going to be the best fit for them. That just means they've got a great marketing budget. That's sure, all that really means. sure, and therefore a big price tag. Right. Um, yeah. And and in my experience, most of these tools and software can do the same things for our clients. I mean, it's a government, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very standardized, it should be. Where 
the differentiators are is customer service, mm-hmm. not even pricing. Even pricing is very, very uh, common and standardized these days. Um, but customer service, follow through, implementation support, project management, that's where uh, the rubber meets the road and they don't quite fulfill their promises or perception. Um, uh, is it is it common for private sector vendors to, to operate in the same way? Well, very much so. I mean, the, uh, the, the private sector vendors very often um, are, are looked upon as a, a partner. Um, you're choosing somebody that you're going to be working with for the next 10, possibly even further uh, along the line uh, road. So, um, you know, we do see the, uh, the oracles, the infors, the, the major players out there. Uh, Epicor is, yeah. is very common. But um, we also are seeing more and more of the best of breed approach. And I think if, if you see our, our top 10 ERP systems lists and digital transformation um, uh, report for 2023, you're going to see a lot of these best of breed solutions are something that's kind of evolving. So it's evolving more into digital enterprise operations rather than ERP systems that are going in because organizations are needing to look at a more holistic view of what they're going after. So very often we'll see major players in the ERP space actually paired with one another in a digital transformation solution. I don't know if you're seeing that in the in the public sector as much. Yeah, to a degree. And, and we're seeing some demos lately from some companies that are up and coming. They tend to focus more on one thing than another. And so it's difficult to find a home for them and some of our larger clients. I do caution the big um, ERP vendors out there for local government that there are a lot of smaller companies out there that are, they're coming for you and they think they're gonna be able to do with customer service. Mm-hmm. It, you have to remember, especially in local government, CFOs talk to other CFOs, they go to the same conferences. It's a very tight knit community. And if your product is not working well in, um, in another municipality, someone's gonna find out about it. And it's gonna be that hesitation mm-hmm. when they get your proposal. Um, and if they have someone that comes in that can offer what appears to be the same functionality, but much better customer service, customer relations, they're going to be a serious competitor. Whether or not they win out, you know, when you do a serious look at requirements is another discussion, but there's competition out there and it's coming for you. Well, I, you know, great discussion. It's been great hanging out with you guys in Knoxville. Um, I look forward to next time, but I think there's a lot of uh, similarities uh, between our operations and, and just the philosophy of business. And it's nice to see someone else out there that speaking the same language and caring for your clients as much as we care about ours. So we look forward to this uh, association and uh, please follow us on our, on our social media. All the links will be uh, in the comments below. Thank you. All right, good stuff. Well, that was a, an interesting clip. It was fun to do. Interesting to see what you get when you put together the uh, thoughts of two different organizations or leadership from two different organizations that do similar things. And uh, there's a lot of interesting takeaways from that. So when we come back, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about some of those lessons and takeaways. But first, we'll take that break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation? Then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 104. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. And and Kyler, we just played this uh, video footage that we recorded in person a few weeks ago with uh, the leadership team at Avero. 
in our leadership team at Third Stage Consulting to talk about you know, just general independent tech agnostic digital transformation best practices. And what were some of your takeaways from that conversation? Yeah, I, I, my, I think there's such synergy between um, the two different businesses, that frenemy label, if you will, because of the mission driven um, dedication to independent advice and the understanding of what truly goes into a full digital transformation. I don't think that many companies really understand the overall lens of that from the human people aspect to the software selection, to the actual implementation, the user adoption, everything that goes into it. And just the need for that in the marketplace, I think is exciting for, you know, for not only this group of people, but to understand why uh, that's so important. Uh, to have kind of that PMO aspect that Greg kind of touched on, to have that ability to have one person or one company or group of people that are truly dedicated to the business's goals and maximizing that value, as opposed to having any other conflicting agenda, is just so valuable. And it's cool to see the evolution of more people having that like-minded vision. Yeah, it is. It's always fun to... Um you know, put your, put your heads together and join forces. And, you know, in some, in some cases, there's times where, you know, being part of the third stage team, you feel like sort of a, uh, not a lone wolf, but you're, you're sort of on the outside looking in because you're not affiliated with a software vendor. You're not plugging one particular solution. You're not drinking the Kool-Aid of any one software vendor, which is what, you know, 98, 99% of the industry does. And so to be that 1% or less that, is independent tech agnostic and is really only looking out for client best interest. Sometimes you feel outnumbered and in many cases we are outnumbered. Um, so it's always nice to have a, a you know, a, a friend of me that does the same thing, but you know, at the same time you can kind of commiserate uh, and join forces in some ways. And that's, you know, what we've started to do with them for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we, we met them at Inc 5000 and it's great to see that success on, on both sides. Um, and, I will just put this out there, but AV did throw his team a pizza party at Inc. Mm. 5000. So I think we're going to have to up our game next year um, when, if and when um, we make the list for, for a party. second time. I if you want a pizza party, we can have a pizza party. I know. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. No, we do lots of fun stuff here, but it's been great to be able to um, collaborate on, on both the, the partnership side of providing the best experience for our clients um, and being able to access their insight. Um, but if you do have any sort of questions about the public sector, you're welcome to reach out to me at kyler.cheatham third stage at thirdstage-consulting.com, I should say. And I can connect you with Megan and team um, to to kind of talk to what what does that um, look like as far as digital transformation there. If you have any questions as well, we did tag them um, in the comments here. Um, but def definitely a great partnership. And like I said, I, I think you found, you know, a kindred spirit um, in AV and being able to have that unbiased and independent conversation. Yeah, I like how you referred to him as a, my digital twin. That was, that was an interesting uh, yeah, metaphor and right? analogy. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a good, good conversation and uh, got a lot of good value out of the, the conversations here today. So thank you for facilitating that too, Kyler, and, and helping uh, guide that conversation because it's always it's always complicated when you have a panel discussion and, and multiple people that are on. So appreciate you helping uh, guide that conversation and some good takeaways there. So I uh, appreciate the guests being on as well and appreciate the audience. We appreciate you being here and listening and uh, being part of the show. And uh, just as a last reminder, new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So um, love to have you subscribe, like the video if you like it, or like the the content wherever you're watching or listening. And we'd also love to hear your comments uh, along the way as well. Any comments you have regarding the show or the topics on the show. So be sure to drop those in the chat as well. So hope you all have a great rest of your week. We'll see you next week on Transformation Ground Control. Take care. Thank you.